from the MTS Academy to have uh, a wonderful guest coming from Pixar. He has a lot of experience in, the, in his hand and also he is a character technical director at Pixar. And I'm very happy to be here with Omar. So uh, I will let him introduce himself because he has so many titles behind him and I want his uh, experience to be shared here with you. Yeah. How you doing? Thank, thanks again for having me, Stefan. It was a uh, really nice uh, kind of uh, getting the opportunity to uh, to meet you just you know a little while back, not too not too far long ago. Maybe you know it's been like a, about a month or so, maybe a little over. But um, appreciate and uh, the opportunity. Um, yeah. So as you mentioned, I'm uh, currently working as a uh, character technical director uh, in the uh, animation feature animation at uh, Pixar. Um, so I've currently been at the studio uh, just over five years. And uh, actually my history and sort of like background uh, it's, it's been kind of varied. So I've, I've had the opportunity to sort of uh, dabble and, and work in a, a variety of studios and industries. Um, kind of initially uh, after graduating art school, uh, I began working in uh, 2D animation as a character layout artist, uh, strictly working in like 2D flash animation. Um, so I did that roughly for about, I'd say about two and a half years. Um, and then uh, once I completed that particular contract, I uh, relocated from New York uh, to California. So I traveled all the way across the, the country from one side to the other I just got in my car and kind of drove cross country and, uh, you know, just tried to find uh, my place in the industry and um, really kind of chase those opportunities. Um, ultimately, I uh, landed a uh, opportunity at a 2K Games. Uh, so I worked at 2K Games uh, on the NBA 2K titles. Uh, so there roughly for about three, three and a half years or so, uh, primarily working on uh, character modeling, uh, doing the likenesses of the basketball players. So taking a lot of the assets that were previously in the games and just updating a lot of the um, assets there. So making sure that the characters and the players actually look like their counterparts in, in real life. So uh, we'd essentially, you know, get, uh, you know, any type of like uh, reference and photos from online um, you know, just try to gather a lot of that information together and try to work on the likenesses as close as possible. And then it got into some fun opportunities too, where we would get to model some of the, uh, the Nike tennis shoes and things like that, uh, all the kind of like the premier, uh, basketball shoes. Um, and then later, uh, we actually started delving more into the college basketball. So we got to work on a lot of the mascots and uh, things like that. So that, that was pretty fun. Uh, so then shortly after working at uh, 2K Games, uh, I then went into visual effects. Uh, so I worked at ILM uh, for roughly, that was a contract position there. So I was there for about a, a year, maybe a little over a year or so. And uh, at ILM, I worked in the art department. Uh, so the, the sort of the role there was more um, kind of like visual development, uh, concept design, uh, so we would get some of the bids that would come in from the different studios, um, houses, and say, for example, if, you know, they have a new film that they're trying to uh, release or kind of get some new concept art or work uh, sort of produced for it, it'd come into the art department. We'd sort of take a, a crack at doing some of the, the different designs and just trying to implement some, implement some of the, uh, um, you know, the character art and, and sort of visual sort of elements of what the film could be and what it could look like, uh, and then kind of send that off as a, as a bid for the film. Uh, then shortly after that, uh, got into VR, so worked in, in VR, so it's kind of that. <laughs> like you shifted from games to VFX to VR? Yeah. That's a yeah. very, very good topic to uh, have a conversation later because mm -hmm. it's for somebody who, most of the 
the artists are just sticking to one industry for hours. Yeah. So I'm very happy yeah. that to have a conversation with that. But sorry for interrupting yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, 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 no problem. I I know it can seem a little kind of like, you know, it it, it tends to sort of like uh, bounce around in terms of like the different genres and me mediums and, but um, yeah, it it was it was a good opportunity to sort of uh, just learn the the different pipelines and different aspects of those particular uh, mediums, right? So, and and the great thing about it was that since I had the background in 2D, right? Um, I, I had always drawn, you know, growing up as a kid, I had always drawn, I always had a pencil in my hand and paper. So I was always drawing. And even till this day, right? Like pretty much any opportunity I get, I kind of sit at the Cintiq and, you know, I, I try to draw as much as possible. But uh, just having that background, um, you know, allowed me to sort of, dabble in, in these different fields. Um, so it was also a great opportunity just to really kind of find my my footing, right? Just to to get an understanding of where it is that I wanted to be. Um, and, and I understand, you know, that's not the norm. You know, a lot of times when, you know, as, as you mentioned, students or people in the industry, they they find that one particular thing that they enjoy doing and they kind of like stick to that. And, and they may veer off a little bit, you know, try something else. But you know, I, I've kind of dabbled in maybe like four different, <laughs> four or so different uh, industries. Um, but yes, a after ILM, I uh, went to work for a company called Linden Lab, uh, which is the creators of uh, Second Life. I'm not sure if you know you or your audience is familiar with that, but um, uh, it was very much uh, kind of like a a new sort of like starting point for the company where we were establishing a new VR platform. So we were building the engine from the ground up. Um, we had a very small team. Uh, I was working as a character lead um, artist there uh, with the company. I probably had about three to four artists uh, working under me. And then we also worked with outs uh, an outsource studio in China. Uh, so I was working there as a lead for about four years. Um, and then, um, you know, as the time continued to go, I, I, you know, I had always had friends in like different parts of the industry. And so I had a, a friend of mine that, uh, kind of reached out to me and said, Hey, we're, we're going to be, uh, you know, opening up some roles at, uh, Pixar. And, uh, he was like, I, I think you, you might, you know, you might be interested. So, yeah, and, and at the time I was like, okay, you know, we'll, we'll see. I, I mean, I knew kind of ultimately I always. I think by that point, I knew I wanted to be in feature animation. Um, it was just a matter of like at what time and, you know, in, in my career, I would actually be able to kind of get there. But and, and I think that was the right opportunity that, that came up. So, uh, yeah, I had submitted my portfolio, met with the, the recruiter and went in for an interview. And yeah, that's. You know, that's, that's kind of the short of it, right? So there, there's obviously, you know, throughout my life, there's been a lots of ups and downs. I don't want to make it sound like it was yeah, just it was like an easy, easy road, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's definitely not not an easy road. Um, but I, I think the, the one takeaway from it is that I never, uh, I never gave up, you know what I mean? It's, it's for me, it was always a passion. Uh, like, I, I feel like art has always been something that's been very much in, instilled in me. So, um, yeah, it's it's just I, I've always told myself if I never work a day in animation, I'm still going to be drawing. I'm still going to be modeling on the side, you know. So, it's for, for me, it's not work. It's 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 always like it's always fun. It's always uh, entertaining to me. So, yeah, basically, like you mentioned, <laughs> it's like it's fine to get into the Pixar. Like it's it's just so like a ordinary opportunity, but. Yeah, basically it was like, like your dream come true at the end. It's not something that absolutely, you have absolutely to through the whole industry. Like it's it's rough. I'm very glad that you say that there is ups and downs mm -hmm. because somebody says when you're joining the industry, the industry is brutal. No, it's like you have to just push it. And afterwards, now if you wanted to just, uh, shift like uh, companies, it's going to be much easier because you have a bigger portfolio and experiences of course absolutely and you absolutely 
with a uh, you have your own voice but that's why you mentioned when we had a conversation of uh, finding your voice and identity in your skills how did you discover your own unique approach um well i, I think for me it's always been uh, a focus on uh just you know appeal and anatomy i think for me um because one thing that I've always found that is a good understanding and a structure of anatomy uh, has always kind of allowed me the opportunity to not only have, you know, a, kind of like a higher understanding of it, but also being able to take that information and to simplify it. Um, so obviously working, for example, at ILM, it's a uh, VFX based. So you're working with um, you know, they're, they're live shots, right? With VFX footage, you're, you're, you're creating these creatures or, or humanoids that are, they have to basically almost be seamless with and seam, seamlessly integrated right into that shot. Um, so your understanding of anatomy has to be, you know, very, you know, top notch. So I think my, for myself, just finding that level of, um, you know, understanding of the structure, uh, learning, you know, what, how, how to sort of manipulate that to, to make it appealing um, has always been something that, that I've just sort of like focused on. So once I was able to, you know, get a, a good understanding of anatomy, um, you know, always studying that, taking sculpture classes, figure sculpting classes, studying books, te uh, texts, you know, things like that. Um, I was able then to take that information and then simplify it. So, um, you know, and, and it's and it's one thing that, you know, and, and I'm sure maybe you've you've noticed this before is that when you see certain artists or 3D artists uh, working in more realistic kind of like um, styles or, or realistic sort of approaches to characters, you know, they want to make something look very sort of like hyper real. You don't normally see someone that's capable of doing that, being able then to switch into a more stylized sort of work, right? Right, same, right. So it's it's like you, you kind of, you know, you sit on one or, or the other side, you know, depending on what your preference is. And I think a lot of that goes uh, for the same for, you know, uh, modelers that like organic uh, modeling versus modelers that enjoy more hard surface modeling. I think you you kind of tend to, gravitate to one or the other. Um, so for me, uh, it, it was all, it had always kind of been a challenge to uh, be able to get a good foundation and a good understanding of realistic anatomy, but also knowing that I enjoy drawing, I enjoy the very stylized looks, I wanted to be able to uh, succeed at that as well. Um, so I, I tried really hard to try to find my way in that. So. I guess what I'm trying to say is that trying to find my voice and my identity was about being able to um, provide, you know, this this sort of like different approaches, you know, whether it's something that's realism, whether it's something that's stylized, I wanted to be able to provide that sort of uh, professional sort of outlook and, and have an understanding for that. So, you know, almost, I wouldn't say a jack of all trades, but you know, somewhere along those lines, right? It's like, yes, you know, if, if you need this to be done, yes, I, I can, I can do that. And I can do it at a, at a level where it's, you know, it's, it's very kind of like high tier. So, um, yeah, but I think for, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, do you understand that because from there you can uh, definitely find your style and uh, be confident. So mostly for young artists, they're, try to become like jack of all trades at the very beginning and that's why they cannot find their voice but mostly yes. when you find something that is unique to you basically yeah. you can uh, work on that like it's like building layers of uh, like a structure absolutely absolutely so what's your advice for students finding in their like an identity into their uh, like a 3d art um, how can they like pursue the career, find their voice, build those structures? Because 
<laughs> basically i will like translate uh, some of your words to them because uh, they when they're somebody starting at the in this industry they're always asking in which softwares are you working <laughs> and with which software that's, are you working on Omar? Yeah, that's that's always the big question, right? What is, what software do you use? What brushes do you use? <laughs> right? <laughs> and you know, it's I think this has been kind of like a, a, I, I wouldn't say a debate, but you know, it's it's always been a topic that's come up. It's like how how do you how do you do how how is it you do what it is that you do, right? So and I think for me is it's really just you just have to put in the time, right? And, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what really, essentially, what software you're using. You could have it could be paper, right? It, you know, if you could find your voice in using paper and you know creating amazing origami or something, you know, it, it's it could be anything. Um, but you know, to to be more specific, for me, uh, when I was in school. When I was in art school, um, I, you know, as I stated, I had always drawn. So drawing for me has always been kind of like the foundation and, and everything kind of built on top of that. Um, I, I loved comic books growing up, uh, you know, X-Men, uh, you know, it, it, anything, you know, pretty much the Incredible Hulk, things like that. Those, those were always kind of like. A foundation for me in terms of character because I, I've always been very character driven. Um, so, kind of fast forward going into when I was in art school, I wasn't completely sure of what I wanted to ultimately do in my career. I knew it wanted to be something creative, something artistic. Um, so, I, you know, I had this instructor, and I it was the first time I had taken a. Um, a sculpting class. It was a figure sculpting class. And he brought in an, an example of one of his uh, casts that he did from from a, uh, this figure sculpture. And that just, you know, just the, the physical kind of tactile feel to it just really kind of opened up my mind to form and structure and and essentially traditional modeling, right? Or 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 sculpting in that sense. Um, so at one point I thought I wanted I wanted to be maybe a, like a, a toy or a figure sculptor, um, but then obviously the all the technology started you know sort of presenting itself. Uh, Maya had already been around for a while, uh, you know a lot of a lot of my friends were using 3ds Max for video games. It was more specific to video games, and right around the time that I was getting close to graduating, ZBrush. Uh, and and I, I might be date, I'm dating myself right now, right? So <laughs> this, this is going back maybe to like ZBrush, I don't know, maybe 1.2 or something like that. So uh, it's been a while, but, um, and I remember being in the, uh, in the room, this was at school, and seeing one of uh, the other classmates that was getting ready to graduate uh, from art school. And he was working in this software that I had never seen before. It was ZBrush. Right? And I was like, man, how, how are they able to get all this, uh, uh, you know, intricacies and, and, and complexity in the model? And it's, it was just, it blew my mind. So <laughs> the high polygons, you know, it's just throwing <laughs> million, millions of polys at it, right? Um, <laughs> so that, that was, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm like modeling, you know, box modeling and stuff. So, um, but uh, yeah, just kind of seeing that and like it really opened my mind. I was like, man, if I could take the knowledge that I have, because at this point I was pretty proficient in sculpting with clay and drawing. So I had a good sense of 3D space in real life with clay sculpting. Um, I, I felt pretty confident in my design abilities because I, you know, I had a pretty, you know, long history in drawing. So I was like, if I could take that information and apply that to ZBrush, uh, and, and I don't want to make this about ZBrush, but, you know, it, it was, I could see where the two sort of elements kind of like really worked well together. Um, so my understanding of anatomy, anatomy and the one the the continuous kind of like pursuit of it right is to trying to continue to get better and better um 
you know, I just continue to try to focus on on uh, 3D packages. But I mean, for me specifically, yeah, I'd say, you know, ZBrush, uh, Maya was a, a big one, obviously, um, Autodesk Maya. Uh, and then, you know, Photoshop for 2D and, you know, using textures and things like that early on, obviously, because you, you have other- We reused Photoshop for texturing 3D models. Yeah, because yeah. Nowadays, we have <laughs> new softwares that you can paint in 3D with generators and that. Exactly. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like you have to texture something and then import it to see if it is yeah. on the render. Right. Uh, yeah. The good old days. <laughs> good old days, even. <laughs> well, that's nice. It, I'm very glad to that we share some of like a similar like, yeah. history, and for sure that's a very good. Thing that you did with the uh, clay sculpting and later on convert to digital sculpting so basically you have had the foundation and everything else but mostly like uh, you mentioned when we had the conversation the importance of accepting your weaknesses while knowing your strengths how that shaped you basically yeah, uh, and I think that's something that's, you know, very huge and kind of understanding and allowing yourself to grow, um, knowing what your weaknesses are and knowing that you you have room to grow, right? You, you don't you don't want to come in with the mentality of, uh, yeah, you know, I, I know that, sure, you know, I don't know, I know everything. It's like, no, they, it doesn't work that way. There's, there's always something to learn, right? Uh, there's always something to learn. There's always someone you can learn from. Um, uh, for myself, you know, I've, I've been in the industry for, you know, over 15 years and there's, uh, you know, there's, there's students that I currently mentor, uh, and they tell me about their experiences and, you know, different approaches and, and there are things that I learned from them as well. So I, I, th I think it kind of goes both ways. Right. Um, but yeah, definitely, you know, and, and it kind of ties back to sort of finding your voice, right? It's like knowing your strength is uh, being able to really hone in and focus on those things that, that kind of make you shine, right? Uh, those things that kind of put you in the forefront of, you know, maybe the, the next artist next to you or the next modeler next to you. Um, finding those things that really interest you and sort of like bring that excitement to you know to your work and you kind of hone in on that and continue to build that and and it you know a lot of times when you look at you know certain modelers or certain artists that are out there in the industry you you can see that they're sort of they they have a specialty in in something specific right they have they have this one thing about them that you know maybe no one else can quite do as well as they can do um so it, it's always trying to find that thing and how do you find that you know, I, I think it's just, it's with time, right? It's, I don't think, I don't think it's something that you can just, you know, overnight say, yeah, this is my thing, but, or, and, and maybe it could be, you know, potentially, but I think it's something that you find over time, uh, something that after you've put in, you know, hours and hours, you know, they say the whole 10,000 hour rule, right? It's like, uh, you know, you're, you're not really good at something until you put 10,000 hours into it. So, um, yeah. Basically, we had an artist here for like a 2D artist, and he achieved success after almost 20 years. Yeah. So, and he is he become like the best border uh, uh, board game artist. Like he creates mm -hmm. games, uh, ilus uh, illustrations, and after 20 years, now he has his own like a. Uh, unique point and he still working in photoshop 7 so that's from 19. oh wow wow <laughs> that's great the uh, game of thrones cards and stuff like it's uh -huh. a very good story as well but i'm very glad that you uh, mentioned that because when students and professionals are starting into the industry they have to continue learning stuff so basically you said uh they don't know nothing because you have to involve because now we have some sort of like a uh, like a, you have to progress every day but how do you stay like uh, in shape in this competitive industry mm. 
Yeah, uh, I think it's a matter of uh, always kind of being uh, present, right? Pre being present in the world, uh, being present in the industry. Um, a lot of times I'll just read up on a lot of information that's currently, ha you know, current affairs of, you know, the industry and modeling, the things that are presenting themselves, um, you know, and, and sometimes, you uh, you know, there, there, there are things that sort of start to pop up in the industry that, you know, for lack of better words, it could be a little controversial, right? And, and, and uh, you know, and without me having to go into detail, I, I think a kind of a lot of a lot of us understand where where I'm going with this. But um, I think it's a matter, you know, you you go to conferences, you uh, you interact with other, you know, other people in the uh, industry, and just kind of find out what studios are kind of doing, or you know, your friends, and and it, it's really just being aware of the information that's out there. And, and I think that's how you kind of like stay competitive. And and you always, and, I, and just to add to that, I think it's always about finding what brings, uh, what brings you the excitement and the passion to your work. Um, Cause for me, it's like, it, it's, it hasn't always just been about keeping up with what's out there it's it's always been kind of a focus on myself and keeping up with myself if that makes sense right it's it i i don't try to uh focus on comparing myself to the next person um i always find the challenge in myself to try to get better for me or to get better within and obviously that that takes having to you know study continue to learn new things, but it, it's always kind of a competition with myself. Um, you know, if I find that, you know, just using character design or drawing as an example, um, you know, if I find that I'm, I'm drawing something and, and I don't quite feel that it's right, I, I need to try to like really focus in and say, I can do this better, right? This doesn't quite look right. This, this, this can be better than what it is. Uh, or or modeling, uh, 3D modeling. I I still you know at work we do a um, sculpting session, usually runs about eight weeks uh, consecutively, and we do figure sculpting. So we'll bring in a live model. Uh, we'll uh, usually one one day a week. Uh, we'll meet with a group of people. It's usually anywhere between ten to maybe about fourteen people. And uh, we'll meet together. We'll, you know, we'll have a sculpting sessions for about two to three hours. And, uh, you know, we kind of walk around and give each other sort of critiques and, and uh, you know, information on how to possibly, you know, refine something or improve in certain areas. And, and you know, I think collaboratively, I, I think that's something that helps you sort of keep up, right? It's like just always kind of like, you know, sharpening the sword, right? It's, it's, you're, you're always want to, you want to be in that mind state of just getting better. But if you enjoy it, right, it's, it's not really work, right? It's, it's something, it's something that brings you passion and something that brings you joy. So um, just continue, continuously, you know, getting better. Um, but, uh, you know, just looking at it as uh, in the way of you're improving yourself. Um, so. Yeah, like uh, I can definitely sense that you're a very uh, you have you have a persistence for sure. Like you're <laughs> persistent about it. I'm very happy to to notice that also. Then we can discuss like the concept of persistence, like uh, overcomes resistance. What challenges did you have where uh, persistence really made the difference for you? Oh yeah, yeah. There's there's a there's a great quote that I've always kind of like gone back to um, uh, persistence overcomes resistance. Right. So, um, and I, I think that's something that's really extremely valuable uh, for anyone, anyone. Right. Um, I think no matter what stage you're in, uh, in your life in terms of, you know, creatively, professionally, um, you know, emotionally, right? Um, staying persistent on something. Uh, and I think a lot of that ties back to uh, just 
you know, having, having the love and, 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 and the sort of like understanding of what that, what it is that you ultimately want to achieve. Um, yeah. And, and just kind of going back, I, I also want to sort of like highlight that there are those moments that you're going, you know, you're going to be going up, right? It's like, you're climbing that mountain and you're working hard and you're getting up, but there are times where you're also, you know, there's hills that kind of lead to that mountain. So there's times that you're going to be going down. And so it's, it's, um, it's, it's a balance of the two, right? Um, so there, you know, there have been times where I've put portfolios or reels together and, you know, I've sent them out to, to a certain company and, you know, and you may get a letter of rejection back. Right. And, and, and one thing to always notice, you don't, you may not always know what the reason is. And sometimes it may not be a reason for what you think it is. It may not be that your work is not good enough yet right now, or you're not at a certain level. It could be that potentially the next person was maybe at a better position for that role than you were. Um, and, and so it's just a matter of continuing to try to get better. And, and it, it's always good, you know, if, if you're ever in that situation where you can potentially ask, uh, a hiring manager or recruiter for feedback or information, right? It's like those little things can help you continue to grow. Um, and I think for me, it was like understanding that it, it wasn't going to be an easy task getting into the industry, right? Um, but as long as I continue to push and I, as long as I continue to try to get better, um, continue to network, right? Uh, that's always a big one. Um, and coming at it with the understanding of, um, you know, that you, you can find your place. Uh, it's just a matter of timing. It's a matter of where you're at uh, in terms of like your ability. Um, and also allowing yourself the time, right? You, you know, I, I think a, a lot of people uh, trying to first get into the industry, they want things to happen right away. And, and it's Fly not, directly from Pixar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and exactly, exactly. And, and it's, it's okay to find a studio or apply at a studio that's not quite at that level yet. Right. And, and this is where you can start to develop yourself, right? This is kind of takes me back to like finding your, your footing and finding your, your, your voice. Um, it's like you work at these studios that help you sort of build on your abilities. Um, and then, you know, when, when you start feeling more confident and yeah, you, you apply at these bigger known studios, but, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, everyone has a different story, right? So it could, it could happen different ways. Yeah, and basically when you're in the hire studio, like I wanted to ask you about that, uh, because uh, critiques is an essential part of growing as an artist. And how has receiving feedback shaped your like uh, career working at Pixar? Because when you work on, let's say for example, those high studios, essentially you have to have a build up so you can accept critics because not not everybody can join that company and like yes. cannot accept critics and be part of that culture. So how does it, how does it shapes you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's a big part of, of your everyday, uh, sort of like functioning and part of your work, uh, right. It, you're, you're going to be presenting to uh, a production designer, you're going to be presenting to a character designer, a character art director, you're going to ultimately be presenting to the director of the film. So you, you have to, you have to understand and you have to know that critiques are, are just, um, the app, the roads to the, the ultimately having success in the work that you're putting together. Right. Um, so it's it's very pertinent that you are able to accept critique and understand that this is not a reflection of you, but a reflection of where the work is and where it needs to be. Because obviously, you know, places such as Pixar and, and other other large studios, they they have a standard, right? That they're always trying to aim for, um, and things are kind of really picked down to the smallest sort of minute thing, right? It's like 
It could be a flyaway hair that they're looking at. And it's like, no, they don't like the hair curling up. They want that hair curling down. So it's it's things like that. So when you when you receive this this sort of feedback and critiques is you have to understand that um, it's it's all ultimately about making uh, the overall film or the or the character better, right? To get into a better place. Uh, for me, in terms of critique, I've I can I can honestly say I've I've never had an issue with receiving criticism. I, I wouldn't say criticism. I receiving critiques because there there's a sort of like a fine line between the two. Um, but for me, critiques or feedback or feedback yeah or feedback um and it's you know I, i've always known that my work is not it's not going to be perfect and, and it's what i see personally and visually from my view from my point of view so not always someone else is going to see or align exactly what it is that that i'm seeing so they may have a different uh interpretation of what it is that they want to be looking for um so understanding that you're collaborating with that person and uh, the critiques and the information that they're giving you or the feedback um, is something that's ultimately going to make that work better. Um, even at times, you know, uh, when I'm working on a character uh, and I feel that I've been sitting with that character for too long, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, take, I'll get my coworker and say, hey, can you come here? Can you take a look at this? And is there anything that you're seeing there that that's possibly standing out at you? Is there anything that's possibly that's bumping for you that's not working? Um, and, and that's always helpful because they, they'll give you a new set of eyes, a, a fresh set of eyes looking at your work, right? So uh, it kind of lets you see it through a different lens. And um, I think that's very much a big part of uh, just growing as an artist. Um, yes, definitely yeah. you mentioned about that big, because when you step back, you're going to see so many stuff that you are missing, but a very good thing that you even like uh, you, you you're a character technical director, and it's very nice to hear that you ask somebody to give you an advice because that is how you grow. Basically, most of the artists has um, like a it's not like an ego or something like that, but maybe somebody is scared to ask, maybe somebody is shy to ask. But yeah. be sure to share. But mostly uh, we know about like uh, asking for a feedback. Let's say we overcome that. But how do you uh, take feedback, critique when you are like a team? Because you are a uh, character technical director and you are part of a team. How do you absorb that? Because you may be working on like a whole character or some sequence of the film. So how do you adapt as a team? As a team, uh, so I think what works well is having those opportunities to uh, kind of regroup as a team and just kind of seeing the overall scope of what it is that you're working on. Um, so a lot of times what we'll do is we'll get together uh, once or twice a week and have reviews uh, on these characters and we'll kind of sit back and kind of go through different um, shots or elements of where the, this character lives. And we'll kind of take that information and just, you know, try to pinpoint things and little nuances of things that are kind of like standing out to us. So, um, you know, I, I think feedback is something that's always going to be present, uh, you know, in, in, in any type of industry, right? And you just, you have to be able to absorb that information and take that and, and be able to take that information to, to make your work better and to just kind of push it forward. Um, in a team environment, uh, it's like you said, it's, it's much different from, say, for example, if you're just working on something personally, right? If you're at home and, you know, you, you have maybe an illustration or a model or something that you're working on and it's something that, you know, it, it's, it's more personal and dear to you. So I think you have a little bit more of an attachment to it, right? Um, not that the work that you do at the studio doesn't have an attachment to what you're doing, but, um, there's kind of, it, it almost has like a different sort of reception. Um, and then, so when you're working in a team, I think being open to that, that, that feedback and being open to understanding that you want to make sure that all these characters live in the same world. Uh, you know, so if you have a character that, for example, 
you know, the the design language of this this world is the characters have, you know, maybe the eyes are a little bit larger. It's like, and and you're maybe quite not hitting that space correctly for your character. It's like being receptive to receptive to that information and that those notes, uh, you know, and being open and willing to understand it. It's just gonna carry through, right? And make things better for you know overall. It's like it's it's what you ultimately you know the position that you want to be in and, and how you want to move things forward. So um, always be open to you know to getting feedback. Um, you know, just the understanding that that it's to make things better. Perfect. I'm very happy to to hear that because you have a wonderful character to progress even further because. You have changed so many industries from game to VFX to VR to animation. So mm -hmm. I, I want to get more into that because uh, you taking so many new challenges. So somebody, like I mentioned at the start, I was very impressed with that you work on many things because the digital industry allows you to do that. So what can you give an advice to those artists that are strictly like I want to stick to games and nothing more because maybe sometimes they have may maybe much better opportunity in other fields mm -hmm. but what do you suggest for them my suggestion is to be open right to be open to opportunities that are not necessarily in just that specific field that you're interested in um because you never know what you can find, right? Uh, I think, similarly speaking, you know, for me, from a personal level, um, it gave me the opportunity to see things differently, to see how the different uh, industries or different mediums kind of like approached their pipeline or, or what kind of things, you know? And so- um, Out of their comfort zone. And get out of the comfort zone, absolutely. That's, that's, a, perfect, that's a perfect analogy for it. And an example, it's, um, it's, it's opening yourself up to learning new things, right? Um, I think, I think it's, it's, it's great, right? It's great to have these opportunities where you can learn uh, from a different industry. And it also gives you the opportunity to bring a lot of that information into that next role, right? Um, a lot of times at Pixar, um, you know, with with them understanding that I've had a background in, you know, these different mediums, uh, they'll ask me, uh, so, you know, is there something that you could maybe add to, you know, the pipeline? Like, is there something different that, that maybe could maybe help push things in a different direction or helps, you know, help add a certain level of uh, clarity to to how we do something because, you know, it, just because, you know, just to say, because I work at Pixar, it doesn't mean that everything, you know, is so streamlined and perfect that everything just works exactly the way it's supposed to work every time, right? They have uh, sort of their, uh, just, just the ways, their natural ways that they've done things for a while and um, introducing different perspectives coming from uh, another industry could help, you know, could potentially help uh, sort of like direct things in other ways that may help them move a pipeline, uh, you know, or, or improve it. A few years back, I've seen that they, Pixar, they're still working in Autodesk Maya 2013. And that's why I wanted to break that analogy of software to doesn't matter in which. No. <laughs> Yeah, you have software engineers and the right. it looks like 2050, but that's different. <laughs> but yeah. You highlighted the importance of always being open to learning. So what's some of the new skills or, or areas you're currently exploring? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, some of the things I'm currently beginning to look into. Um, I've always been interested in uh, shading and hair grooming, um, which, yeah, Maybe which at, at work. Here to us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I could use a little bit too, right? So, <laughs> just a little, little more on the top. Um, but yeah, I've, I've always been uh, interested in, in groom um, and 
Uh, I haven't had the opportunity to do any of that at work specifically. Um, and, and I'm hoping there are, there are some opportunities in the future, but um, that, that is one of the areas I would say that, that I've always kind of been interested in. And it's like, even just as, as a, uh, you know, visual development artist or, um, you know, maquette artist or, you know, character modeler, it's like, the ability to be able to round out your character with all the app, you know, the, the, uh, the different elements of, of that asset is, is a great, you know, sort of like skill set to have, you know, it's like, you almost want to have that toolbox, right? It's like, you have all these different tools within that to create this one thing. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely, I would say shading and grooming is are probably two areas that, that I would be interested in, or, or I am interested in, and, kind of delve into a little bit nowadays. Well, I'm very happy to hear that because that's a quite a challenge because it's yeah. not just like grooming, but it's mostly how um, they're going to do it in animation. And basically that's a very, I would say quite good thing that you're trying to do because you're going to complete characters because you started from clay and now you mm -hmm. digital and now you have the full package, but I'm very glad that you have the like uh, the the goal that you're working on. But how can you like uh, give uh, some of the seeds from your passion to the young artists? How can they like see few years into the future? Because they now even like, they cannot see their next steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, I, I would say just to give yourself time right to young students give yourself time to to sort of fall into new things um if you have a particular passion that you're interested in um you know just continue to build on that right and continue to improve in, in that specific area i you know there to me there's there's no rush to try to jump into something new all the time you also you want to give yourself and allow yourself the time to really absorb and learn uh, what it is that you're currently uh, sort of like, you know, working in or, or the, the, the aspect of that pipeline. So, you know, ad the advice that I would give to, to sort of young students is just allow yourself the time to, to learn the thing that it is that you're currently in, you know, enjoy the process, right? You, you, it's, I think ultimately, I, I think that's what it comes down to is, is just really enjoying the process. What is it about that? uh that new sort of either technology or software that you're interested in learning is is it just to add something new to your to your belt like a new notch in your belt or is it something that you're interested in? is it something that's going to bring you joy um you know for me it's like 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 i was mentioning it's like you know with hair grooming it's it's not just about applying you know these curves and 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 building these hairs it's like how do you shape the hair, right? There's, there's, there's liveliness, there's character in the hair. It, it adds so much more information to the character. So, it, so it's just kind of like continuing to build on top of that. So you definitely need to go to the barber shop and <laughs> fundamentals learn, <laughs> basically for grooming. I mean, there you go. <laughs> but there okay, you go. You, you mentioned quite well that you're doing that because you wanted to get out of your comfort zone. Yeah. And we have a discussion that maybe we can do like a masterclass with you in the future. We're going mm -hmm. to see that, but uh, that leads to ask uh, to, to me to ask the question: Why would you like to like teach some of the these students? Because you mentioned that you have mentored somebody. So, what's the thing that that uh, gives you the ability to help? Because previously, I suppose mm -hmm. that somebody has mentored you, like, uh, and you want to return the favor. Or is it Absolutely. something that somebody didn't mentor you and you just wanted to give some piece of advice and help mm -hmm. somebody? No, uh, absolutely. I think it's the former, right? Um, I've had, I've had multiple uh, mentors that have kind of helped me throughout my career in different stages. Uh, I've had mentors that have helped me with my character design. Uh, you know, when I was working at uh, ILM. Um, I was uh, working with uh, uh, Carlos Huante. Uh, if you're familiar with Carlos Huante, he's a creature designer. Uh, so I, I had the opportunity to work with him for 
uh, a short time at ILM. And then, you know, what, even after he left, uh, you know, I would keep in contact with him and kind of get uh, feedback from him uh, up, up until when I started at Pixar, uh, you know, even, even going as close as, uh, you know, up to five years ago or so, six years ago, um, when I first started at Pixar, because, you know, Pixar has a very unique uh, sort of approach and pipeline where character TDs, uh, in, in my sense, where I'm character uh, modeling and rigging, um, where primarily at other studios, they don't model. If you have a character modeler, they're not also rigging the character. They're, they're usually either doing one or the other, right? Uh, at Pixar, we're responsible for doing both. Uh, so we usually spend a good portion of the time uh, modeling, I'd say, I'd say the ratio is probably anywhere between, uh, maybe 40% modeling to maybe 60% rigging, uh, give or take. And coming into, uh, Pixar, I, you know, my, my background never really, uh, allowed me the opportunity or provided me the opportunity to have a position as a character rigger. So I kind of came in uh, as, you know, very little knowledge of rigging, right? So it's like my, a lot of my focus uh, had always been in modeling and just, you know, trying to be the, the best at modeling that I could possibly be with a little bit of understanding of rigging. You know, I had some courses in, in art school and studied a little bit outside of that, but uh, to be at a proficient level of, you know, feature animation, you know, I had never done that. Um, so when I first started at Pixar, I, I had a mentor, uh, which obviously not only to assist me with the Pixar specific pipeline, uh, but just understanding how structurally, how things work, uh, you know, when, when working on a rig for a character, um, so for me, it's like, it's like you said, you know, it's paying it forward. Um, I, I can see the, the, the excitement in young students eyes when, you know, they, they kind of envision the, the world of, of animation or games or whatever it may be. And, uh, you know, when I see someone that has that passion and, and they, they want to, you know, really thrive at it, it's like, you know, and, and I have the time it's, yeah, I, I try to kind of provide that that sort of structure or um, leadership for them to to help them kind of help guide them in the right direction. Um, so I think it's it's definitely a, a matter of um, trying to help, you know, that next student sort of or person kind of move forward in, in their goals. Um, and that's why I love the industry because in the future that person will help another person. Yeah. Help the another person. Because absolutely love basically sometimes uh, I can hear like uh, the industry like you mentioned it's up and down but every industry is up and down mm -hmm. but most absolutely just focusing on this but mm, like uh, you have a lot of work going on and a lot of like uh, people follow you so for the our audience that uh, and also our students, how can they follow you and see your progress as well? Do they follow you on LinkedIn or any other platform? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am on a couple uh, social platforms. Uh, LinkedIn, you can find me, um, Omar San Cristobal. Uh, I'm also on uh, Instagram, uh, Omar San Cristobal there as well. Uh, and my tag uh, is listed under, it's called My Homie Omi. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, I, I'm on, I'm on those, I, I'd say I'm probably on Instagram, probably the most posting updates uh, of various things. You know, sometimes my, uh, you know, sometimes my 3D uh, models and sculptures, sometimes I do just stand, you know, little doodles and sketches of characters and things like that, or just kind of like everyday happenings. But um, yeah, I'd say those are probably the two uh, most uh, frequent social media platforms. Um, I do have a website as well, which you can find me under. It's Omar dot San Cristobal, um, but uh, that one's a little bit outdated. I wouldn't say like a lot of the stuff on there is is 
really the most recent stuff. It, it does need to be a little bit more updated. Um, so it's, it's been a few years since I've put any any kind of newer things on there, but you can definitely find a good a good. Uh, so with uh, this podcast, we're going to get you out of your comfort zone now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can see a lot of my older stuff in there. <laughs> well, that's yeah. a very nice. Uh, when somebody is like uh, constructing a portfolio, everybody is just placing the best stuff into it. But <clears> when <throat> I go to a profile, I want to see the cube and how they progress. It's like a yeah, the progression. Time yeah. lapse. It's like a very cool thing. But sometimes uh, I've seen that HR from studios, they just wanted to see the best stuff and give to the yeah. directors. So I have always an argument with them. So I uh, uh-huh. but <laughs> another conversation for another time. So the final piece of advice. Uh, what's the one final piece of wisdom you could like to share with aspiring 3D artists? Like uh, something that you can leave a mark and they can continue from there. Yeah, um, I say, final, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's always a tough one, man. I feel like it could be very subjective, but um, you know, I, I'd say just you know, personally speaking, um, in terms of advice, I, I would say, if you have a true passion for what you're doing, just continue to push forward. It's it's going to happen. It's going. I. I can almost guarantee it's going to happen. You're going to have, there are going to be moments where you're feeling absolutely great and you feel like you're moving in the positive direction and you may trip and fall. And the best thing that I can tell you to do is just to get up, brush it off and continue pushing forward, you know? So there, there are going to be moments that, you know, you're going to, you're going to potentially apply at a studio and get a rejection. And, you know, when that does happen, just understand that that should be the motivation to continue to work even harder. So always use that as a stepping stone uh, to get you to the next level that you need to get to. So as long as you you truly enjoy what it is that you're doing, um, I think it's going to take you a long way. Um, And just kind of going back to the quote that I mentioned a little earlier uh, in our discussion, Stefan, um, that, you know, Resistant, uh, persistence overcomes resistance, right? So I think understanding that and really understanding what that means, uh, that'll take you a, a long way, so. Yeah, for sure. Because when they grow, definitely they will understand that and they're going to try to push them to the new generation. But I'm very happy that you've been uh, with us with the Interest Academy and doing this podcast because I will definitely name you a king of persistence for sure. Because, uh, you have been from like uh, starting from zero and going up with uh, like uh, one of your dream jobs with Pixar. But definitely you like to get out of your comfort zone and become <laughs> a grooming artist. Maybe in the future you can make a hair for me and for you. but i'm very happy that that we have connected and uh that we can share this story with the younger aspiring 3d artists like uh audience yeah absolutely my pleasure yeah thank you for having me really appreciate it perfect so see you all right